thank you for uh, for inviting me here. And uh, I haven't, I think, been to Genoa in ten years, and I just forgot how how beautiful this city is. Uh, and it's also really nice to see um, old friends. So what I'm going to give you is kind of a um, an overview of work that we've been doing over the last maybe eight, nine years. Um, and what you'll see is machine learning and geometry, and a lot of it. OK, so this idea of studying shapes, right? Um, one way of thinking about it is if you th looked at how people thought of uh, organisms before Darwin, if you thought of people like Linnaeus, there was this very platonic perspective. You have the ideal duck. You have the ideal chicken, right? And and I think a lot of geometry has classically also been platonic. And you have again this this, this analogy of talking about genesis, right? And I think one of the one of the uh, you know this type of genus, this type of genus. So what was really I think one of the brilliant things that Darwin thought about and wanted to highlight, and this I think because he was thinking about evolution so much, is what's interesting is variation. And what I would like to, again, highlight today is when I think about geometry, I'm really interested in variation. Uh, another perspective on geometry from a book that's absolutely beautiful is uh, by Darcy Thompson on growth and form. Okay, that's more of a developmental perspective. And if you ever want to do conformal mapping between humans, chimpanzees, and baboons, it's in the book. OK. My colleague, Doug Boyer at Duke, one of the, interested in, one of the reasons he's interested in shapes is he's an evolutionary anthropologist, morphologist, and he wants to understand from the shapes, can we get some notion of species trees? And he's very interested in understanding how would this look different than a gene tree? And is there some type of selective pressure? OK. So a while ago, there's this German guy who knew a little bit about geometry and thought about shapes, right? So there's Riemann. And then there's Kendall, Kendall Shape Space. I'll show you a little bit more about that. The Lie group or the diffeomorphism-based approach, which I'll talk about a little bit. Most of my focus will be on ideas using integral geometry. And um, I will start, I'll show you how some of these can be unified via a fiber bundle or sheaf theoretic contribution approach, OK? However, there is a really, really important person who worked on shapes. And if you uh, look at this slide, you might notice uh, who that is. Some of these are really cool papers, by the way. Um, OK. Huh? I don't know. <laughs> so uh, back in the day, what people considered data is you'd go to the British Natural History Museum, and you put down points on an artifact, and you'd know what those points correspond to to another artifact. You'd call those points landmarks. And then what you would do is you would compare the landmarks, modulo, rotations, translations, and scalings. And this is called Kendall's shape space. OK? And it has a notation. Now, <laughs> there's a paper by Carl Pearson where he used Kendall's shape space to try to figure out whether Cromwell's skull was really Cromwell. And if you look at this paper, uh, they had to do comparisons. And they did something which I know today no IRB would be approved, is they collected skulls of other prisoners that had been uh, executed to do the comparisons. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> nowadays, a lot of the data are meshes. So 3D meshes, this is one morphosource. There are other ones. Uh, and it seems very sad to take this 3D mesh and turn it into points. Um, so this is work that my colleague Doug Boyer uh, 
this is something he started and I worked on with uh, another of my colleagues at Duke, Ingrid Dobashis, and we've been extending, and I'll show you some extensions, is that you put down a bunch of points, and then what you do is put little areas around them, and then you do the variational calculation of how much it costs for moving one shape to another shape. Okay, and this is the this is the Lie group or diffeomorphism based approach. Now the issue is sometimes uh, these are um, fly wings. Sometimes shapes are qualitatively different. You gain a lobe, you lose a lobe. You gain a vein, you lose a vein, and so diffeomorphisms are a little bit tricky. So this is actually what the data look like. These are the meshes, the collection of vertices, faces, and edges. And this is what's called an off file, so it's stored as a bunch of vertices, and you say which of the vertices come together at triangles. Usually you don't have edges. <coughs> this suggests that maybe simplicial complexes and simplicities make sense, right? So I'm just drawing you points, 1D simplex, 2D, 3D. And a simplicial complex is nothing but this construction, so all the faces are in the complex. Simplicities intersect around common faces, so these are illegal examples. Okay. Now, this slide, when people look at it, there's a lot of, what the hell is this? Okay. So I'm going to later on talk about shapes and kind of minimal requirements to be able to do things like inversions of radon transforms and look at sweeps of shapes, okay? So there's this idea the logicians came up. These are called O-minimal structures. And it's a set. And what you're doing is if you look at any axis parallel sweep through the sets, it has to be tame. And what has to be tame is something called uh, the Euler characteristic curve. And I'll define that. But this is nothing but a set of tameness uh, for these sets, OK? is what it has. One way you can think about it is whenever you project it, you get algebraic or semi-algebraic sets. Okay, but we'll come back to this. So we'll basically, we'll say shapes are constructible sets. These are collections of compact definable subsets of OD. And a constructible function is an integer value function on a tame set X. And every level set has to be tame. Okay? We will see what, I'll give you guys examples of this very soon. It's mean, no, 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 that's fine. Think of it as non-fractal. It means if I sweep through it in any way, the number of the way the number of critical points has to be controlled, right? I have to have like a finite number of critical points for any sweep through the function. Is I, I'll I'll actually show you, but if you look at the Euler characteristic, how often that changes? Okay. OK, another kind of concept which we'll come back to is one way we think about these shapes. And this unites the Kendall view and the diffeomorphism-based view, is you have a base manifold. Evolution is, let's say, happening on the base manifold. And then you have fibers. And these fibers are how we represent the shapes. You can think of that, these as decoration. So in the case of Kendall shape space, these fibers are vector bundles, right? And in the case of diffeomorphisms, they're fiber bu bundles. OK. And in some sense, these are all vectors and vector spaces. But just think of each of these as shapes, like a molar. OK. Now, what I'm going to first tell you is I want to do the following. I want to model shapes without requiring landmarks or diffeomorphisms. And to do that, I'm going to transform the data into a representation that I can use standard ML methods or stats methods to work with. I want this transformation to be injective, so there should be no information lost. I want the transform space to be nice in that I can do things with it. And for interpretability, I want to be able to pull back from the transform space. OK? So these are the, the things I want to require. And I'll look at two summaries, the Euler characteristic and persistent homology. I just put this picture in because I like it. But the idea is sometimes abstracting things gives you some idea and intuition. OK, so for a mesh, the other characteristic is nothing but number of vertices minus edges plus faces. OK? Yeah. 
And what we'll do is we'll take a shape, this is actually heel bone, and we'll sweep through different directions and compute the other characteristic curve. So in this case, I'm sweeping from here through here, and I'm looking at how the number of vertices minus p faces plus edges is changing. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I'm going to do this from many, many directions. And we'll get to the question of how many directions as well. OK? OK, so basically, you, you do this, and you do this from many directions, and you collect these curves, and that's your summary. OK? So I've turned a shape into a collection of curves. OK? And as I said before, these curves are really ca capturing how the critical points are changing. Yeah, exactly. I will answer that question. OK, the other summary, which I'll talk about a little bit less, is what's called, uh, well, so this is homology. So B Betty 0 is the number of connected components. Betty 1 is the number of one cycles. Betty 2 is the number of holes. And you can go on, but it's hard for me to show pictures. Uh, and so this is Morse theory in 20 seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this landscape and I'm going to start flooding it. And I'm going to look at the, the sublevel sets and how the structure of that changes. And this is telling me something about Betty Zero. So once you get here, you get a feature. It's born. Feature is born here. At this point, another feature is born. But when I get to this, it's going to die. OK, and you just keep doing this. And this is called a persistence diagram. And it's a summary of this function. OK, and it's pairing these critical points. This is another version of it. So you have these filtrations, which are all these proper subsets. And you look at when homology changes. Okay. And so persistence diagram is a countable multiset of points. And we give the diagonal infinite multiplicity. So let me kind of give you an example. You have the red curve and the blue curve. This turns into the red persistence diagram and the blue persistence diagram. And then you can measure distances between them by doing some type of transport map. And the reason why we give the diagonal infinite multiplicity is if you can't map from a red to the blue, you just map it to the diagonal. OK? Well, I'm using this distance to measure the similarity. The, these diagrams, yeah, yeah. OK? Now, you can ask me whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. I will get to that. OK? And you can prove that there's some notion of stability, and that the curves, are, if the curves are similar, you have some control over the distance on the diagrams. Okay. OK? So more formally, I take a shape F, M. It's in this nice constructible set. A map, the Euler characteristic transform is a map from the sphere to the space of Euler curves. OK? So another way of saying it, this is your object M. You're going in a direction V. You go up to height T, and you compute the Euler characteristic of M intersected with the sublevel set in that direction, going up to point T. This is the same thing we just integrated in zero mean it, so it becomes functions in L2. And then you can do the same thing with the persistent homology transform. It's a map from the sphere to the set of diagrams of different dimensions. There's a commutative diagram, but no one cares. Um, now, you can now start measuring distances between shapes using these summaries. Now, if you notice, there's a problem here, which is this integral over the sphere. right? And on my computer, it does not like doing the integral over the sphere. So we have to discretize it, and I'll get to that in a second. Now, there's, there's an idea. The way that actually you get these CT scans are from something called a radon transform. So you take the shape, you radiate it, you look at the projection. And you do this for many, many, many directions, right? And you can think of this as, oh gosh, Plato's cave, right? You can, except for instead of one, you have many. So there's a question that a computational geometer named Leo Gibas asked an algebraist, uh, Pierre Shapira, which is under what are the weakest conditions such that this problem is well posed. And you can invert it. And this was Shapira's answer. 
Now, what I want you to take out of this is that you see this notion of constructible functions, right? That goes back to the constructible sets. So that ominimality was a minimum requirement for, their, for it to be invertible. And then what you see is you're basically looking at Euler characteristic transforms of things really related to projections, okay? So this is called Shapira's inversion theorem, okay? Using generalizations of Shapira's inversion theorem, we and others have proved that the Euler characteristic transform as well as the persistent homology transform is injective, okay? That's all well and good, but how many directions do you need? And I'll get to that in a second. There's another way of thinking about it, which is often a, state, a step in shape analysis is you have to take the shapes and you have to kind of figure out what rotations align them, right? Uh, and so one of the things that's interesting is you could think of the directions as random. So I just take these different directions. Now I have a random collection of curves for one shape, curves for another shape. And then what you can basically show is if you do optimal transport between these two, right, you can actually measure the distance between the similarity of the shapes without needing this alignment, okay? That's the theory version of this, okay? Here's a question. How many directions? In 2D, it's clearly 162, and in 3D, it's 700. I, I'm joking. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so Arnold has beautiful, many of you beautiful papers. There's one paper where he asks the following question. If I tell you the critical points of a, fu of, of a function, how many homologically different functions have those critical points? And in this paper, he gives a closed form solution to that question, which is impressive. Yeah. He gives a closed form solution. This is not a joke. This is, yes. It's a beautiful paper. It's called The Calculus of Snakes. So the question is, can we do the same? We can't do it closed form. So if you have a space of shapes M, there are embedded simplicial complex in RD. You have some lower bound on curvature. And the reason you need a lower bound on your resolution of curvature is two things that are really, really flat look really, really simple. Similar, right? So they're really hard to tell apart. So you have to choose at what point you're OK with saying two things are the same. And then what you need to do is in, take any small cone. If I sweep through any small cone, I need, a con I need control over how often the critical points can change. I need an upper bound on that. Okay, so these are the three numbers that fall into uh, this moduli space of shapes. And this is the formal definition of curvature. I'll let you read it. So again, it's this idea in a small cone, and it's telling you how often the sublevel change sets can change. So this is a picture I want to have in your head. What we're really doing with these transforms is we're stratifying a sphere, okay? And the idea is if I know the Euler curve in this direction, within this cap, I know the other Euler curves are linearly related, right? So I actually don't need to know all of the Euler curves in this cap. I only really need to know one. So it comes down to a question of how many caps are there, right? And that's the answer. Uh, this took a lot of work, right? And what's really kind of was cool is you start seeing VC type results and sour salak type uh, actual computations in getting in getting this result. But again, this is the, nothing more than how many caps you need to stratify that sphere, and it becomes a problem of hyperplane subdivisions of a sphere, and this is why it be looks like things like VC dimension, and then yeah. And just some, and people might notice, people who've done some learning theory might notice that. Okay. So, I told you that you can think about things in terms of fiber bundles. Um, now, the problem is when you start looking at these Euler or persistent homology transform representations, 
because you can work with shapes that are qualitatively different, they're not of the same dimension. So the fiber theory kind of falls apart, right? So the question is, is there something else we can do? And I'll quickly go through this because I'm not sure how many people are going to care. But with, especially with the persistent homology transform, there's a sheaf theoretic construction of it. So you can replace the fibers with something called a sheaf. And this is a definition, so this is it has a particular push forward structure. But this is a point I want to tell you. The object the objects again are constructible sets in RD. And before in the fiber case, I had a base manifold. Okay? Now instead of having a base manifold, I have inclusion maps. Okay? And I need some notion of continuity. And the kind of notion of continuity here is something called the Grothen Dieck site. And if someone really cares, I can show you later exactly what the definition is. But let's just go on and say that the map from the shape to the persistent homology transform is a homotopic sheaf. So we actually have this notion replacing our Viber bundle picture. So these are the inclusion maps. And above them, we put sheaves. So that's probably the most general version of shape space that's out there. In doing this, we realized for a, sh for a mesh, zero degree homology is, is enough. You don't know it loops. Okay. This is a machine learning seminar, so I think I should show you some data analysis. And this for two things. We're going to use Gaussian process models to make predictions using these uh, representation. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to show you a, one result at least. Okay, so. These are, these are not heel bones. We took heel bones of primates. We took the persistent homology transform. We used that to compute a distance matrix. We did multidimensional scaling and put it into 2D. Okay? If you notice, the great apes are up here. Uh, oh, no problem. Uh, scaling dimension one, scaling dimension two. You can do it in three and it looks better. But let's start in two. <laughs> So these are these are all great apes. This is a lesser ape. This is not a spider. This is a spider monkey. This is a macaque. This is an extinct old world uh, monkey. So most of these up here are old world monkeys, except for the spider monkey. Uh, this is a squirrel monkey. This is a howler. This is an extinct new world monkey. These are all new world monkeys. And these are all lemurs and their friends. OK? Uh, heelbone. Heel bone from the calcaneus. No problem. And so Doug makes better pictures, and he actually knows like what taxa things belong to. And so <laughs> that's the picture. Um, we also did simulations, but this is an interesting picture. So this is what you get from the persistent homology. This is what you get from the uh, diffeomorphous embraced approach. This is what you get from manually placed landmarks. And this visually looks a little bit better, but there's a very basic question that is still open and we're actually trying to answer, which is when the shapes are no longer diffeomorphic, what is a right notion of distance? Right? What is mathematically formally a right notion of distance? And another question we want to understand is when, when these shapes are diffeomorphic, under what, like, can we prove that the persistent homology transform approach goes back to the fiber approach, right? Goes back to the diffeomorphism approach, and 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 what extra penalty do topological math question that we are trying to answer? They look different, and Doug liked this one better. Uh, we did simulations to actually show things that one was better than the other. And the actual answer is, I like to call it cauliflower or broccoli. So if you have something that's tree-like, if you only work nearby, the diffeomorphism-based approaches are going to be better. But if you want to start comparing things very far away, the uh, these transform versions work better. on the simulations where he actually knew what the exact shapes were. And so one thing that we did 
and this was very, very costly, was something like a gram of Hausdorff distance, right? Which is how much does it cost to move one set to the other set, right? So for example, but I, 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 one of the things that when you, and you'll, you'll see this as I go through the talk, one of the things that's super hard in this shape space world is doing simulations that have meaning, right? It's, and, and just setting that up is super hard. And we have ideas, we can do things, right? But we haven't published them because we don't know how to do simulations. And this comes up again and again and again. Okay, so this is a glioblastoma. Well, this is actually a brain. There is a glioblastoma. This is it segmented. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask, we have 92 patients with MRI data and, uh, and um, clinical data. And we have gene expression. And we're going to ask, these are morphometric features that oncologists and radiologists kind of manually came up with and curated. And topological features using um, what we call the smooth Doyler characteristic curve. Which of these best correlate with disease-free survival or overall survival? So that's the question we're going to ask. And um, we take slices of shapes, and then we take many directions, and this is what the smooth Euler curve looks like, and then we stack them, and that's our feature. We used Gaussian process model. I think everyone here knows that, so I skip it. And we used a few different kernels. We used um, linear kernel, a Gaussian kernel, and a heavy-tailed Cauchy kernel. And then we asked the following question. Which of these features do best in terms of minimizing root mean squared error? And again, we see the, uh, the smooth Euler characteristic transforms very well. And how often is it optimal? And these are all done with 80%, 20% test train splits. OK? So that was some kind of interesting. But it raised the question, can you do variable selection? Can you tell me what parts in three space are most variable between these two shapes? Okay. Now, I'm not going to show you this in, um, in cancer, because cancer is too hard to get some ground tooth and figure out what's going on. And this method that we used to do this is called Sinatra. And I'll give you a sketch of it first, and then we'll go through some of the steps. This is group of species one, group of species two. I'm looking at the Euler characteristic transform. And then I'll tell you how we do this. We do variable selection to figure out. And then we basically use geometry. And here it's absolutely vital we have shapes. We actually have the 3D objects themselves. And this is a false color map showing you in red the parts that are most variable between the two types of species. Um, yeah, OK? So I'm going to talk, walk you guys through this. OK, we call it a pipeline. I already told you the first part of the pipeline. The second part is a Gaussian process. Okay. The third part has two components. First component is going to be, how do you do variable selection on a kernel model? OK? So we, so, and you might want to use kernel models because just like somehow we're partitioning variation and in information on the shape, right? We, it's very natural to think about partitioning variation in any biological thing. And you can even think about it genetically, right? There's the additive genetic effects, there are nonlinear genetic effects, and then there are environmental effects. So in a linear model, you can basically take your data x, project onto y, and get a beta hat, right? Um, yeah, and often that's a pseudo-inverse or you can regularize. So what can you do in a nonlinear model? And I can give you more details about this, but I'm not going to belabor it very much, is you can think about doing the same thing. You take your, you use a kernel model to fix f, and then you project back onto your data, and you get a beta hat. You can think of this as a Taylor expansion. So specifically, we had a Bayesian model, a Gaussian process, that gave us these f hats, and then we got the variance, and then we basically did something very much like a pseudo-inverse to get back 
the effect size analog, okay? Now, once you have this beta tildes, you can't just go home. You can't just say, oh yeah, this beta tilde, you know, for this coordinate is bigger than the other one. And the reason you can't do that is these are all co correlated, right? So what you can do is something that we call centrality and ranking of variables. So one way to figure out which of these basketball players might be most relevant to the team is get rid of them. And there was a natural experiment that was done in Chicago <laughs> when the, some guy in, you know, this is sometimes more funny when I say it at Duke because Duke and North Carolina and basketball have, anyways. Um, guy, the guy left, he decided he could play baseball. Turns out he couldn't hit a curveball, but that's a different issue. And you see how well the team does, okay? So that's exactly what we do with our beta tildes. We take, these are Gaussian, we, 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 because it's a Bayesian method, we have many, many draws. For, to make our life simple, we just assume they're that, the, that it's Gaussian. And what I do is I remove it, and I compare that to marginalizing it, right? Because I want both of the uh, distributions to be the same size. I compute the KL divergence, and then you can explain this, think of this as how important J is, and then we just normalize it. Okay, and that's what we call the rate variable, and that's how we get which direction and which and in and what height is the most important. Okay. 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 Now we need to map the features back into the shape. The mathematical idea that lets us do this is that we're stratifying a sphere, and in each stratum, it's linear. Now there's a very key concept which. Going into this whole project, I should have figured out, but you know, I learned, you know, I figured it out later, and I'll tell you, and you'll realize it's kind of obvious. When you do the radon transform, and you look at your data, within any cap, they are linearly related, right? So you have basically a pasting of a set of linear models. Once you invert that transform, that is no longer true. So what are we really doing with the Euler characteristic transform? There was originally a shape somewhere. Someone took a bunch of, well, someone put it in a machine, right? Uh, it did the inverse transform, and then it, well, it did the forward transform, and then it did the inverse transform, and that's what it's stored as in a computer. And what we're doing with the Euler characteristic transform is we're just undoing that inversion. <laughs> we're actually literally doing that forward right, radon transform. And what's interesting about that is once you've done that, within the cap, things are linearly related, right? So you can really exploit that linear structure. Okay, so pick a cone for each direction, find all vertices that correspond to features selected by this rate method, and you repeat this procedure across clones. So one way of thinking about it is I know the direction and the height I need to get an XYZ coordinate. I have two coordinates, I need the third. So you can take three directions in a, in a cone, write down a overdetermined system of equations, and try to get at what Z is. Pictorially, what we're really doing is taking these cones, we know the heights, and we're just laying, basically taking all of those and taking the intersection of them. Okay. Now. There's a really key problem, which is, how do you check this? How do you simulate this? How do you know what you're doing is correct, right? That seems like something that's important. So one thing you can do is use ideas from, com from computer graphics, which is, I took a tooth, I color in areas that I want to character, like highlight, make bigger, and then I do it for class one, and then let's say for class two, and then I ask, do I get those areas back, right, as the parts that are really different. And um, you can do that, and you can pick three peaks, five peaks, seven peaks. We also did this with spheres. I didn't show you those pictures because they're a little less interesting. Um, and you can get RSC curves, and you can see you know, how much harder this problem gets, and so on and so forth. Um, so we also, we wanted, we published this in an applied stats journal, so we needed some type of real data set, 
we might have some understanding of what's going on. So what we have is we have molars from different suborders of primates. And we know how far these primates are from each other. And we know for one of them, um, the periconid, the cusp, has been retained. So let me show you a picture. These are the different primates. These are the phylogenetic tree. I honestly don't right now remember the time the most recent common ancestor. Uh, and we know that then the tarsius, there is this cusp. And we know over evolutionary history, it becomes weaker and weaker. And so we ran our Euler characteristic, I mean this uh, Sinatra, on these things pairwise, all I think relative to the tarsus. So Samari tarsus, Mirza tarsus, uh, Mike. Microcebus tarsus, and this is what you get. As you get further apart, there's more red. And you see this periconid showing up stronger and stronger. This is the furthest. Okay, we've extended this to apply to protein structure, which I will just show you a picture of. Wild type mutant, take the atomic uh, positions, construct a mesh from it, do the Euler characteristic uh, transform. Here we use a slightly different Gaussian process model, um, and then we use a very, very similar reconstruction algorithm, and you can visualize the structural enrichments, for example. So we, you can also do this for fields. So everything so far I've told you is about shapes, right? What happens if you have soft tissue, where it's not either there or not? It has some value, right? So can you do this for fields? It turns out that shorter answer is yes. Um, but we should have figured this out earlier. And there's a very simple way of doing it. So people who have studied MRI or have studied um, cosmology have used a lot of extrema of random fields to study null models. Okay, and there, what they do there is, let's say you have a box, and within that box you have um, the MRI of, let's say, I don't know, a brain. You basically filter based upon the function value, and then you look at excursion sets of that. Okay, so that is what we ended up doing. We're filtering by two things. We're filtering by the height function, and we're also filtering by the function value of the set. So instead of getting a curve in any one direction, you get kind of almost like a matrix. OK. And what we did was we used this lifted Euler characteristic, and we compared it to a very, very carefully trained deep neural network. So this is using the Euler characteristic plus a Gaussian process. We're trying to predict different types of breast cancers, right? Again. Um, Here's 50-50 train test split. Um, and bottom line is we are almost competitive with a state-of-the-art machine learning method using, um, using this representation and just off-the-shelf GP. Okay. This is work that's in progress, but I wanted to tell you about it because I think it's really neat. So let me show you. Okay. The picture I want you to have is that evolution is going on on the base manifold. And you have these shapes that live on the fiber. Okay, And what I'm going to try to argue, and I'll show you mathematically formally why, is that you can think of this as a Gaussian process. So there's a random variable z that's a Gaussian process with an evolutionary kernel on the base manifold. And then conditioned on z, where you are on this base manifold, there's another Gaussian process that's modeling the fiber. OK? OK. This is a Gaussian process we're going to think about on base manifolds. This is very standard. You can have an ornstein ollenbeck model. You can have a Brownian motion model. Brownian motion means there's no, uh, no selection. You can have a version that is something called a burst model. For all of these, you can write down what the kernel is, and it's going to be related to uh, the time to the most common ancestor. Okay. Now, mathematical property of fiber bundles is that they're local trivializations. 
So you have this commutative diagram, and what this commutative diagram actually suggests is there's a product structure on the base and on the fiber. And having that product structure on the base and the fiber is why I can think about this as a hierarchical model. And another thing I can do is I can actually, well, let me tell you what, let me tell you a kernel we use that's not quite right. And I'll get to why it's not quite right. Here's a map from one shape to another shape. So what I can do is try to write down this correspondence map and minimize over some set of diffeomorphisms. Often these are conformal maps because it makes things more computable. And I'll use think of that as a distance. That's my continuous Procrustes distance. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second. And then what I'll do is I'll use that continuous Procrustes distance as my kernel for the, um, for the fiber, okay? Now let me just go back here, okay. So you can actually define a Gaussian process on fiber bundles because you have this jointly normal structure, which is this product, okay? Okay. This is not kosher, but I'll get back to you and tell you what's kosher in a little bit. What I mean by this is not kosher is if you look at our data set, when we ran this, empirically, this kernel is not positive semi-definite. You get small negative, negative eigenvalues. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. So what we can do is we want to get evidence for two evolutionary models, MI and MJ. Okay. So what I'm going to suggest you do is you, uh, let me just show you. Yeah. What you do is you write down the probabilistic model. Let me actually just, where is it? Ah, okay. Let me, I should, okay. So we have two types of parameters. We have the base parameters, and we have our fiber evolutionary parameters. And what I'm going to want to do is marginalize out the fiber parameters, right? And that lets me compare two different types of bases, right? Um, and because these are all Gaussian processes, everything is Gaussian, right? You can actually compute these notions of evidence, OK? Great. There exists a theorem. What this theorem states is if you write down, a, if, you, if you have a manifold and you write down your Gaussian process on the manifold as e to the minus geodesic distance, okay, unless that manifold is isometric to Euclidean space, it will not be positive semi-definite, okay? There, it, and, and the reason well, why that, that, in a way, intuitively, the reason why that's true is you can't just go by the geodesic. You have to kind of integrate across, right, the different paths. And so one way to do this and make it positive semi-definite is solve the following stochastic PDE, okay? You take your Laplace, Beltrami operator, you have these as F as test functions, and that's equal to the Gaussian noise lifted under the manifold. And you solve that stochastic PDE to get your kernel, okay? There are other ones you can do. You can put in slightly different functions here uh, to get different types of kernels, but this is something you can do. And the other point is uh, there's a notion of something called a rough horizontal path. And so there is an infinitesimal generator for the kernel if you do it like this, okay? There's still a lot to do, okay? Uh, for, let's not, we'll ignore that for now. Uh, we're doing notions of dictionary learning. Right now we're sweeping through the whole shape. But let's say you only think parts of the shape are preserved, right? Then you can think about localizing the transform and doing something there. Um, I gave you an algorithm. It might be nice to have a theory here. There's, there's beautiful theory on lifting uh, Brownian motion onto manifolds. Um, um, I mean, uh, going back to Maldivan. Okay? So one thing that we're working on, how do you do this when you lift onto a sheaf? Or how do you do this when you lift onto a stratified space? Right? And, and the problem is these objects are so algebraic that doing calculus is a pain. Uh, 
this is what I was trying to tell you. We're trying to unify the diffeomorphism based and the sheaf theoretic constructions. So what's the notion of control functions on sheaves? How do you write down that variational problem? Um, what does that variational problem mean? Right, that's something we're thinking about. Uh, well, this is something that's an applied project that I really want to do, which is statistical and quantitative genetics based on shapes uh, traits. You know, can we get estimates of selection, so on and so forth? I spelled selection wrong. My co with my colleague Lauren Crawford, who's at um, Microsoft and Brown, his student Emily has recently made some really nice progress on generative models of, of shapes. Uh, and that's been very interesting. The thing that we have, I think, figured out now, but has, again, been very tricky, is how to, given the simulations we do, how to make sure what we're doing is sensical or not, right? Um, yeah, I think one really interesting idea is integrating the physics of imaging with some of this theory. So it gave you an upper bound on how many directions you need, right? And it was a ridiculous number. But there's a very practical problem, which is we're working on a project back at Duke where uh, we're looking at people with glioma, and people often survive for a long time. And the idea is instead of starting right away and rating getting the hell out of the person, where the tumor, you know, part of it might select and bad things can happen, can we just watch them for a while? And every once in a while, we'll do a CT scan or an MRI, and we'll see if things have gotten much worse, okay? This raises a question. If you're going to be repeatedly giving people, you know, CT scans, right, is there a way of lowering the radiation burden? So if I have a bunch of uh, tumors of some type, is there a way I can go in and figure out how many directions and what directions do I need, right, to get an epsilon approximation, right? And then, you know, you can probably just take the Siemens device, adapt it a little bit, re just reprogram it, right, and, and, and do that for the treatment. Then you, maybe you can bring them in more often. Okay. There are people who talk to me. There are people in multiple countries who've given me money, and it's been a pleasure. <laughs>